I'm Brian McCreeth at GBH in Boston with composer Omar Surillo here with El Puerto Rico, a project of MIFA, and uh, thank you for being here. It's thank wonderful you. to have you and to hear your music as part of this project. Absolutely, thank you for having me. Um, I'm so interested in, in the music that you've written because it's first of all very fun, um, it's very colorful, very energetic, and um, yet I also <clears throat> noticed that you have a background with a, a, an amazing array of mentors and teachers, <laughs> and some of the key names that just jumped out to me, I mean they're all great composers, but some of the key names are Christopher Theophanides, and uh, David Lang, um, and uh, let's see, who else was it? That, oh, Aaron J. Kernis. Yeah. Um, wonderful composers. Absolutely. And I wonder, in, in your experience, um, how, how those composers helped to pull the authentic voice from Omar, um, what it is that uh, you, you, you received from them as you were learning your craft that allowed you to find your voice. Yeah, so one of the things that they're they're all really big on is the idea of being honest with yourself musically. You know, if you're writing something that you don't feel like it's completely honest, then, you know, there's some issues there. So I think that was that was really the biggest thing and I remember uh, it was actually David Lang who said this to me. We we were eating we were drinking coffee outside of the Yale library and you know, he we were just talking and uh, he was basically asking me, you know, how, how's your semester going? And it was a good conversation. And so, you know, we got into the topic of composition. And I was sharing with him that I felt that there are certain things that I, I didn't feel comfortable doing or some other things that I maybe I wish I hadn't done. And I think, you know, at the end of the conversation, he basically said that, you know, you really just have to be honest with yourself. And if you feel good about it, then who cares what anybody else thinks? You know what I mean? <laughs> So, yeah, yeah, and sure. And, you know, and hearing that from him really, um, really, it, it, it struck a chord on me. You know, it's a very simple thing to say to someone, right? But, you know, when he said that to me, I was like, wow, you know, he, he's, he's really right, you know, so. Well, and, and your, your notes for Pitoro uh, mentioned specifically um, drawing on memories. Um, so I'm curious about your memories, uh, especially of Puerto Rico from your childhood, mm -hmm. um, and how... How, with that honesty in mind, um, using the honesty that you were encouraged to mm -hmm. use, um, how those memories take you to certain um, certain musical formulations? How does how does music arrive after contemplating those memories? So, and particularly, actually, in Pitoro. <laughs> right, right, right. <clears throat> so I think um, you know this whole project that I've been involved involved with with Mifa has been a bit of a nostalgic experience for me because I've, you know, I've never uh, been commissioned to write music for this sort of cause, this sort of, you know, reasoning behind it, you know, for the Puerto Rican community, right? And so, you know, I had to really dig deep because I've, you know, I, I unfortunately don't get to visit Puerto Rico as often as I wish I would. You know, my, I have a lot of family still there. Um, uh, but I've, I've just been so busy here in the States that I've just, you know, I've been very, uh, it's been very unfortunate that I haven't been able to visit. So I had to just draw from all of those memories when I was a younger kid living in Puerto Rico. And thankfully I had some pretty good memories, you know. And, um, you know, in the music, <clears throat> um, I wanted it to be somewhat light and fun and, you know, Funny enough, it was influenced a lot by you know, some of my you know, favorite French composers like uh, Messiaen. I absolutely love him. And so, I mean, we can talk about that a little later if you wish. But um, so, you know, just memories from whether it's, you know, going on, on a car ride around like uh, old San Juan area or just going to the beach. You know, I remember I used to be able to walk from my house to the beach and it was just an amazing thing. Um, but yeah, basically just sort of those, those things like that. You know? and, and so what I hear you saying is that um, your memories don't necessarily evoke sort of um, archetypal Puerto Rican music itself. It's the emotion and the experience of being in Puerto Rico that, that kind of got translated in, into the music. Yeah, that's a really good way of looking at it. Um, you know, there are a few things in the music, for example, there's some syncopation in there, but that's, I think that's just a natural thing, you know, within me, it's an honest thing, right? Um, and, um, but yeah, you know, it's, 
there, there are a lot of things that I didn't appreciate as a kid living in Puerto Rico, yeah. music based, right? Um, and so I think it's sort of a way of reflecting back and just sort of remembering like, you know, what was it like? Like if, if, if I were to, you know, return and be that little kid again with what I know now, how would I see things a little differently, you know, that sort of thing. And speaking of things that maybe a kid wouldn't necessarily relate to, tell me right. about the title, Pitorro. <laughs> <laughs> so Pitorro is a uh, Puerto Rican moonshine. <laughs> right. <laughs> made out of, I believe it's made out of uh, sugar cane. Okay. So the sugar, it's, you ferment the sugar and you end up with Pitorro. And I think you can add all sorts of different um, fruits in there to flavor it. You know, you can have like a strawberry Pitorro or, you know, blueberries or whatever. And so um, honestly... I learned about that word, um, I don't know, I was visiting my dad, and he, and he was telling me, he's like, oh, look, you know, check this out, I made some pitorro, I was like, what is that? And then he, so he explained the whole thing, I'm like, oh, okay. <laughs> so I, I just thought it was fun to name a piece pitorro, just because I love the way it sounds, and just the way it looks, you know, with, as far as, you know, titles, you know, sometimes it's sort of like the way that the word just kind of makes you feel. Not, it doesn't necessarily reflect so much the music. It's just the way it looks on paper, the way it kind of like, just the things that it kind of makes you think of, you know, when you see a certain word. That's sort of what I go for with titles. Pitoro has the sense of festivity about it and the sense of fun. And I think that's reflected in, in the music itself. Um, Absolutely. It's a really fun piece of music to listen to. Probably pretty fun to play, I would think, for the musicians as well. <laughs> Isla Verde. Um, has some of those same qualities, uh, but but it is a very different piece. Um, and and the title Isla Verde. Let's mm -hmm. start there with that piece sure. as well. How does how does that title um, reflect something about that particular piece of music? Sure. So Isla Verde is the 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 neighborhood area where I grew up in in Puerto Rico before I moved to Florida, and that was where we had the house where we could walk to to the beach. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I, I don't exactly remember why I picked the title Isla Verde, probably just because I had this, you know, I, I just had this attachment to, you know, that area. And, you know, in, interestingly enough, the music is very, it's, you said so yourself, it's a different piece from Pitorro, and it's, it's honestly, it's a little bit darker, it has some different textures in there, and, um, I see it as the older brother of Pitorro, you know, and so in my family, I, I, I only have one sibling, so I'm the older brother, so maybe I'm Isla Verde and my brother is Pitorro, you know, but um, so in a way that was sort of um, the idea and there, there's some, there's a, little, a few connected, um, there are a few things in there that connect uh, Pitorro with Isla Verde. Like just a few little, uh, some gestures in there, you know. But Isla Verde takes on a complexity um, that, yeah, maybe owes to a darker flavor, maybe a little bit the older brother's complexity, maybe, if we sure. can put it that way. Um, and what I, what really struck me in Isla Verde is, is the passing of a line among the instruments of this ensemble um, that add up. Um, and, and, you know, it, what, what results is, to my ear, some of the some of the rhythms that one might associate with Puerto Rican, Puerto Rican music, but transformed because they're not coming from the sources that you normally hear them from, and because they're being passed around this way. Right, right. It's almost like a like a deconstructed idea, right? Where, and that that's sort of uh, the way that I approached it. And you know, going back to what I said earlier about the influences from some other composers, especially. Uh, French composer Messian. Mm -hmm. You know, the Quartet for the End of Time is one of my favorite pieces. And what I really love, and so something that I learned, you know, by studying the score, is that even though you have a group of musicians playing together, they don't always have to play together the entire time, you know? And I, I, of course, again, that's a very simple concept, you know, but the idea that I can just have piano and some percussion stuff happening just for a little while was really attractive to me because. It just, you know, not only does it give everyone else a break, but it just gives the piece sort of like this open space, you know. And then, of course, the idea of passing around melodies back and forth. Um, so, yeah, I mean, uh, I know that in Isla Verde, there's a section that um, 
everyone's playing in unison, which of course it's something that I, you know, I, I was inspired from the Quartet for the End of Time as well. You know, there's that movement where everyone's playing the same note, you know, just uh, together. And it's, it's, it's just, I love that sound and I wanted to figure out a way <clears throat> to do that with Isla Verde. And that's that one sort of beginning section where it's kind of loud with the snare drum, you know? Yeah, yeah. So. Um, now, if, if someone were to look through the catalog of works by Omar Soria, <laughs> um, would they find a lot of other pieces that sort of are in this same mold, same sort of trajectory? Or, or um, are these pieces departures from what you, what you usually set out to do? You know, uh, beginning with Pitorro, I feel like my compositional voice, my style has definitely taken a new direction. I feel like I've been able to finally put together all the things that, I, that I've always wanted to do as far as uh, whether it's stylistically or harmonically, that sort of thing. Um, you know, not to say that I couldn't do those things before. I mean, I, I did. Uh, but I think this is, this is definitely a new direction with how I was able to organize these ideas, you know, and especially with the, with the rhythmic organization, their harmonic uh, material in there, and even with the, um, uh, the overall syncopation throughout the different um, sections. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and writing for this particular arrangement of, of instruments, what, what's called in music circles the Pierrot Ensemble, right. um, it's a small, compact, it's meant to be very economical and mm -hmm. concise in its, in its resources. Does this sort of new direction that you found with Pitorro uh, sort of inspire you for maybe something on a larger scale that picks up on that momentum? I think so. Um... To be honest, it was very difficult writing, uh, not for this particular ensemble, but this particular uh, set of instruments. Yeah. Because um, it's, it's some, you know, I, I had never done it before, and Pitorro was the first time that I, you know, had tried that out. And there were times when I found myself, I found myself composing, thinking, okay, what am I going to give this instrument? <laughs> because, you know, I, I, as, you know I, I play a lot of my ideas on the piano, and I have to be really careful not to make it too piano heavy, of course. Sure. I mean, that's like a natural psychological thing, right? Um, and so that's why I wanted to make sure that everyone had their own little time to sort of shine. So I think on a larger ensemble, um, you know, I think that's something that I definitely look forward to doing. Trying well, out, yeah. Well, I will look forward to hearing it too. <laughs> <laughs> and and actually, it's it's very interesting to hear you say that that it, that you that there were times struggling to find the voice for the various lines, mm -hmm. especially in light of Isla Verde, where 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 you did throw things all over the over the map at, in certain parts of the piece in, sure. a, in a really yeah. fun, creative, colorful way. Thank so you. Um, yeah, yeah, it's really wonderful. Yeah. So Omar Surio, thank you so much. It's it's wonderful to hear your music and wonderful to have you here. Thank you for having me. Absolutely, thank you.